Welcome everyone to Sasha Talk. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Sean Hamilton in conversation. He's the author of When Your Partner Says Me Too, Your Role and Responsibilities in the Recovery Process. He's passionate about helping partners and survivors navigate the complex journey of supporting their loved one's healing process. Drawing on his extensive research and experience, he's developed practical insight and actionable advice that can help anyone in the situation feel more informed, empowered, and equipped to support their partner. Sean brings his unique perspective and expertise to share with audiences that can help make a positive impact in people's lives. Help me welcome Sean Hamilton. Welcome, Sean, to Sasha Talks. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Today, we'll be discussing your book, When Your Partner Says Me Too, Your Role and Your Responsibilities. Now, when we think of the term Me Too a few years ago when it surfaced, it is a very complex and convoluted topic to explore because everybody has an opinion and emotions that accompany it. Uh, What was Me Too in your perception and how did the book come about? Yeah, so the Me Too movement from from just my perspective was... um, it, it was just an uprising in a culture where a lot of survivors of sexual violence feel that the system that is, you know, supposedly designed to protect them is failing miserably uh, on all levels. And with the rise of, you know, social media collaboration and connection, um, it just rose out of a need for people to feel validated and heard and to share their experiences so, you know, the world could actually understand how bad of a problem uh, sexual violence actually is within not only our local communities, but just global communities as well. This is a problem that reaches far beyond the bounds of just America and where where that kind of movement originated, it, it, it goes well beyond the boundaries and reaches kind of every aspect of the world. And I feel that the, the Me Too movement was just a, um, a collection of uprisings where people just felt like they had had enough. They, they needed to share their experiences of what has happened to them. Um, you know, and I, I understand that it, it kind of took on a, a political context and it got very uh, micro focused on the entertainment industry. Um, but, you know, this this goes into every industry around the world uh, in any kind of business organization. It, it reaches really far. And so um, the book came about because two weeks into my wife and I's relationship, when we were just dating, uh, she got sexually assaulted by kind of a quote friend of hers that had been in her life for a while, but I uh, came to find out he had actually assaulted uh, six or seven other women in the friend group uh, that she was a part of. And um, when it all came out, she was the, she decided she was going to be the last one. Um, and so we went through uh, the civil court and criminal court, and I was just there with her through that whole process of trying to seek justice. Um, and the courts failed miserably uh, a- on a lot of levels. And that was just the beginning. And really where it comes from is out of the compassion and the empathy and just the experience that I had as a partner being kind of shoulder to shoulder through the recovery process and seeing what it did to a relationship, see you know how it impacted her on all these different levels, you know, especially in the context of our relationship. And so once we had gotten through the, you know, kind of acute phase, I call it in terms of like when the trauma is like really fresh and really um, kind of extremely painful, there's a lot of things coming up, a lot of emotions to be dealt with. Once we had kind of gotten through that, we started to kind of analyze different moments, different kind of, uh, exchanges that had happened, different triggering events that had taken place. And how did I show up as a partner? And was my role in that important? Um, And we just started analyzing it, just started asking questions in this context of, you know, how did I show up versus how do you think, you know, those situations would have gone had you been with any of your, you know, previous relationships? Um, and we just started kind of analyzing, you know, what was my mindset? What did, how did I show up well? How did I not show up well? 
Uh, where were the points that I could be better? And did the way that I show up help reduce the time and suffering that she was going through so that we could actually get her healed uh, and heal our relationship and recover our intimacy and recover a sex life that, you know, could be exciting and without a lot of the trauma that, you know, starts to bubble to the surface when somebody's, you know, kind of going through a recovery process from sexual violence. And that's really where the book came around was really in kind of analyzing and understanding how important my role was. And that got me to ask a lot more questions. So I started looking into, is there any information out there at the very beginning of this whole, you know, kind of ordeal we were going through, I started looking for resources and information. How am I supposed to show up? You know, how am I supposed to react? Uh, one of the more kind of pivotal moments, I would say, in a partner's life and in the recovery process is in the book, what I call kind of the worst case scenario, where you're engaged in uh, sexual activity and somebody has a history of sexual violence and they have a, a triggering event, whether it's a sight or a sound or a smell or just any kind of uh, body memory or flashback occurs. And that peaks their kind of adrenaline and gets them kind of spiraling. And all of a sudden they end up in a full blown kind of PTSD reaction, panic attack while you're in the midst of sexual activity. And that moment, if we were to take a snapshot is so challenging to navigate uh, from a partner's perspective, as well as from a survivor's perspective, but just thinking about it in terms of from a partner's perspective, how do we show up in that moment to keep them on the path of healing versus what are the things that we could do either consciously or unconsciously that could actually further ingrain the trauma that they've been through, further causing harm, furthering the guilt and shame spirals that they may already be in? How can we show up to mitigate a lot of that energy and really help them heal? And so that was really the, the focus of my kind of pursuit and research because I couldn't find any information when I started looking for it. I was like, I just identified how important my role was and then was just kind of blown away the fact that there's just not a whole lot of information out there talking about what it's like to be a partner of a survivor of sexual violence. The book took about five years in the making, and you touch upon the different types of research. What were some of the sources that you came about? And initially, when you started the research, what was the main objective or question you were trying to answer other than the role of the partner? And where did you land five years down the road? Yeah, I think the, the main objective is to help people get out of suffering and to help couples recover their relationship. Because I saw at the beginning of my relationship kind of, uh, you know, and this isn't the first time I've been a partner. In the book, I talk about how um, when I was 15 years old, my first girlfriend in high school had gone through a lot of, uh, you know, sexual abuse when she was a, a, a child and a kid. And, um, and it came up in our relationship. And so in the context of, you know, this relationship as an adult with my wife, um, I had already kind of had a an understanding that this was going to impact our relationship in a pretty big way, emotionally and physically. And so really when it came to writing this book, it was how do we recover our relationship and how can I help reduce the amount of suffering, uh, the amount of kind of turmoil that they, you know, that my partner, this person I love is going through and how do we recover the relationship? How do we recover our intimacy and our closeness and the connection to where it's not something we have to fear, but it's something we look forward to. And in the, in the process of putting together the book, yeah, the, the, the research was pretty in depth. I, you know, just a lot of different scientific journals, documentaries, um, articles online, talking to, you know, a bunch of survivors, uh, partners of survivors, just really trying to understand some of the perspectives of the mental health community and what resources are available and what is the, you know, current modalities that help people get out of suffering the fastest. Uh, Cause really, you know, one of the things that I looked at was I didn't want, you know, my wife to have to suffer for years and years and years, uh, you know, kind of going to traditional, you know, talk therapy and, you know, hoping that it would, you know, turn a corner in five to 10 years or something. And it was like, we were really looking at how do we, you know, speed this process up? And is there any therapy modalities 
you know, currently being practiced that can drastically reduce the overall time it takes somebody to recover from something like this. And so once we had kind of identified a lot of the information that I wanted to put together, then it just came down to, um, you know, really crafting the, the book as a resource for not only partners, but survivors themselves to create this kind of bridge of communication so that partners and survivors could understand each other more um, and create a kind of uh, environment of empathy and compassion and, and really a dialogue because now you can speak a little bit more fluently kind of the same language so that the partner is, you know, more trauma informed and understands the signs and the symptoms uh, beforehand so that it, you're not, you're not having to always react to things, but you can kind of take a more proactive approach. Speaking on perspectives, were there any perspectives that you came across that surprised you for better or worse? Um, yeah, I think that uh, just paying attention to the social climate around this issue always surprises me. Um, there's there's one kind of concept that comes out uh, when you start kind of looking into this issue, like, you know, just sexual violence as a whole. There's this phrase that comes around that's called a rape culture. And the mindset of the people who oppose the idea that a rape culture even exists uh, absolutely astonishes me with the amount of evidence that is kind of globally uh, present in, in terms of all of the different environments that exist that kind of perpetuate the um, harm and, you know, create an environment in which predators can operate almost with impunity without any type of repercussions or uh, punishment. And so, those mindsets always, it, it did astonish me. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I found it, I found it really troubling and, and pretty problematic in terms of uh, how do we, how do we get a handle on um, not only in our own relationships and the recovery process from the individual's level, uh, the survivor's level, but from a society perspective, if we can't even address and, and come to terms with the fact that there are environments that allow this type of abuse to continue to happen with seemingly very little consequence or, um, you know, uh, repercussions. I'm surprised to hear that there are people in denial of the rape culture, even in the United States. Th does this emanate from some types, some types of institutional settings, or is it just a certain type of demographic <laughs> mindset that is in denial of this? Yeah, I think it. I, I think it has to do a lot with kind of political identity. Um, you know, I'm I'm not. I'm not an expert on that field of sociology and like why groups of people tend to, you know, start collectively thinking the same kind of ways. But it it seems to me that it comes from an ideological perspective that uh, centers around um, this notion that there is this kind of man versus woman battle of the sexes, that this idea of uh, a rape culture that was coined in the 70s by the, you know, the feminist movement is, you know, only to disparage the names of good men uh, rather than actually looking at the evidence and actually, you know, trying to understand what it is that a rape culture even is. And I think where I've come to really, um, my position in this is trying not to keep the conversation about a rape culture at a low large level, like a society, like trying to paint America as a rape culture, but more so really identify at a lower level, like within an organization, how does a rape culture exist in an organization or around an individual, right? Like a Larry Nasser, who was a doctor inside of the USA Gymnastics organization, who abused and, you know, assaulted over 300 girls, many of them Olympic athletes for the United States gymnastics team. So you have this incredibly powerful organization like USA Gymnastics, and you have, you know, feeder organizations like coming from uh, Michigan State University who employ this doctor who create an environment around him in which no one's asking the questions. And when people come forward, they're silenced. And when they take it to the FBI, the FBI doesn't do anything. And so if we start asking ourselves questions about 
like what are the environments around individuals where are the environments and organizations like in the book i do a case study on the catholic church um not in the sense that i'm trying to disparage the faith by any means but really hold accountable organizations that know that this abuse is taking place and don't do anything to stop it and that is at the very heart of what the term rape culture has come to mean to me is is there abuse happening do people in authority know about it and what is being done to prevent it and if the unfortunate answer is that nothing's really being done they're just moving these priests around the world uh to different parishes and different dioceses and no one's actually being held accountable well then we can obviously say there there is a rape culture present and you know that's a rape culture that primarily affected little boys and you know so i think trying to approach discussing rape culture is to get people out of their political identity and really understand the issue because i think that for a lot of men <clears throat> who may feel that this is kind of a battle of the sexes thing or a feminist idea i would just challenge that and say where are the you know try to spot the rape cultures that affect men because the prison you know kind of the prison industrial complex is a place where a lot of men end up being sexually assaulted and that's a place where most of the people aren't going to there's no real deterrent there they're already in prison some of them are in prison for life so what else is there to punish them for and there's no real repercussions or protections or preventions uh that are that are doing the job to make you know that threat neutralized and if we you know look at the organization like the boy scouts is another organization that really affected primarily young boys and you know men and that's an organization that had a rape culture present in it for over 100 years where the authorities knew what was going on and didn't do anything and didn't you know uh, arrest or hold accountable the people that were perpetrating it and so i would just push back you know a lot on that idea in terms of you know getting people out of their political identity to really look at what a rape culture means before you just kind of dismiss it out of hand you host a strong sense of a reality check when you began writing your book was there any misconception that you had about me too that ended up being proven wrong um a misconception about me too um i don't know i i don't know that i had any real misconception about me too i think I think some of the misconceptions as I was writing the book were uh my own kind of mindset. I think that was something that came uh crashing down hard on me was really taking a look at my own life and my own actions and uh you know really evaluating how was I showing up in different moments in my life uh that kind of contributed to environments that you know may have made people feel unsafe and that was really I think the a really large kind of uh self reflection that you know I talk about in the book is is just really doing the the real personal work around that is like knowing that you know okay just because I'm not a you know a uh, a perpetrator of the violence how am I contributing to it and I think that's the misconception is that there's like this you know this nice guy mentality where it's like oh I'm a nice guy this doesn't really concern me this isn't an issue that I should really care about because I'm a I'm a nice guy. I don't I don't do that. I don't identify as, you know, that kind of toxic person that's out there, you know, perpetrating this kind of violence and yet at the same time it's, you know, there is no kind of shield you can wear that, you know, allows you to escape responsibility when you are a member of the community in which this is taking place. You know, you're uh, I was a member of the Boy Scouts my whole life. I was a third generation Eagle Scout, um, you know, and I was also a member of the Catholic Church and I was, you know, going to going to church a lot and uh I'm a member of the community in different schools and groups and you know, it it really started to be like why am I not asking more questions, you know, about these different environments? Why are we not establishing ways to protect the vulnerable uh in these different environments in which we already know abuse takes place and that was the gut check right is the is is my misconception is that oh well if i'm not contributing to the violence then you know then i'm not part of the problem and yet at the same time if you if you really do the hard look at yourself and go well just because you're not you know a part of the 
you know, quote, like the actual act of violence, that doesn't mean that we're not sitting by complacently allowing the environments that these perpetrators exist in. Uh, we're still contributing to the fact that those environments exist. And so that's really what, you know, has kind of fueled the fire, so to speak, to uh, stand up, raise my hand to be counted, you know, and, and really fight, uh, try to take this to a, a cultural space and, and really try and help move the needle a little bit on how we're actually approaching these conversations. Sean, you're also a proud veteran of the U.S. Navy. Understanding for members that contribute to the military, there's a certain type of mental and emotional conditioning that they adhere to. And given your experience, did that help you connect with your wife better? Or did you have to overcome any blind spots with the prior professional conditioning? Um, well, I think the military conditioned me to to feel very confident in myself, uh, is what I would say. And so when it came time to stand up, you know, and raise my hand and be counted, the confidence that I have in myself to, you know, to, to fight the fight um, was, yeah, I think has been contributed, you know, by the, the, the military experience for sure. Um, you know, the sense of purpose and, and duty that I gained while serving in the military, uh, being a civilian and, you know, losing that in a, in a sense, I think has, um, you know, I've reconnected to it, uh, finding a, 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 a new calling, a new passion, a new way to contribute to the community and do good, uh, a new way to serve those that, uh, you know, may need some help. And I, I, I think that, yeah, I, I, it helped me and my wife in that regard, because it was, you know, something that I think makes her feel uh, heard and validated is to have somebody on, you know, kind of in her corner that's, that's willing to uh, do the work and, and go out and try and help others. Focusing on validation, what are two action steps that people could adhere to when they come across either a partner or someone they know that has gone through any form of sexual violence? Um, I think listening, active listening is, is some, is a skill set that I would strongly encourage people to look into how to better that in their own lives. Um, because, and oftentimes I think when we hear something like that, or we hear somebody has a challenge or a problem or is struggling, we, we immediately seek to try and provide a solution. Um, and in doing so, we can, you know, run the risk of drowning out the the person who's just trying to feel heard and feel validated in the moment. Um, so in the moment that somebody tells you their story, it's really not on us to create a solution in that moment. It's just on us to listen. It's on us to to be there and show compassion and, you know, really understand that it what it takes for them to be able to share that. Uh, it's a pretty deep scarring pain. And for somebody to open up and tell you about it, uh, it, it speaks volumes to the strength and courage that they have. It speaks volumes to the trust that they may have in you. And it's, it's something that should be honored. It's something that you should take, uh, you know, kind of a deep respect for and not take lightly. And, um, yeah, I think that active listening is a is a skill set that is is challenging because it goes against it goes against the nature of uh, a lot of how we're conditioned because we always need to respond with something and in those particular cases not responding is sometimes the best uh, course of action and just really being there and listening and saying you know I, I I write in the book there's a phrase I use a lot which is thank you for sharing when I feel like I need to say something. Um, you know, to, to either break the kind of awkward silence that may exist. Uh, I just use the phrase, thank you for sharing, because it, it, it just, I think it reinforces, you know, my gratitude that they've allowed me into their life in that way, uh, as well as, you know, allowing me to, to kind of share that I've heard them and, you know, and we can, and kind of move from there. I think another Another skill set I think that can help people uh, with the validation is um, self-regulation. Uh, it kind of goes along with listening, uh, but it's it's much more complex and uh, a difficult skill. To be honest, is um, when when somebody shares something like this, typically they they mean a lot to you, right? They're they're in your close inner circle, 
whether you're uh, a parent hearing your child talk about this or you're uh, a loved one, a spouse, a boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, significant other, this person who's sharing this deep pain is they, they are close to you. And the last thing we want to hear is that somebody has, you know, intentionally caused somebody we love harm. And it's, it's a really emotional moment. And it's really important for us to be able to control our emotion in that moment because, you know, this person is vulnerable. This person is, is kind of opened up emotionally and we don't want to then, you know, kind of flood their senses at that moment with our anger and rage, which is, you know, a very natural response to hearing that somebody that you love has been violated in such a horrific way. Um, but it really does require a skill set of self-regulation. And so I would, I would say that's one of the more important skill sets that a partner um, can learn to have in this, uh, you know, in this particular scenario, it comes in and it pays a lot of dividends to have self-regulation skills throughout the entire process. Thank you for educating us on that. As we come to a close, let's focus on the book cover. Yeah. It is a mouthful because there are a lot of details for anyone willing to extract information from it. And I noticed yeah. on that pile of books, there is the Emotional mm-hmm. Intelligence 2.0, Asking for It, The Macho Paradox, and The Body Keeps Score, which is an actual book that I covered two years ago. For Emotional Intelligence 2.0, what is Emotional Intelligence 1.0? Um, well, I think it was just like the first iteration of of really coining the phrase and the concept around what emotional intelligence is. And it was a... Um, it's really looking at your ability to understand your own emotions uh, in any given moment uh, based on any kind of given different stimuli that can happen, Uh, really understanding your emotional needs, your concerns, your requests, being able to identify how you're feeling and why you're feeling that way, Uh, but being able to do that in a calm kind of manner where it's not, you know, even in the most heightened situation, uh, you want to have control over your emotions. And, um, you know, no matter what the scenario is, it's never a good idea to just, you know, be controlled by your emotions. You kind of always want to be in control. And so emotional intelligence is really about understanding your emotions so that, you know, the next phase of it is to be able to understand and navigate the emotions of other people. And that is, in, in essence, what creates, you know, somebody's emotional intelligence is is how well they can control and understand their own emotions, as well as, you know, understand, spot and respond to other people's emotions. And then, you know, how to communicate in between those two things, right? How do you communicate your emotions in an effective way? And how do you help people uh, communicate uh, their emotions? And how do we, how do we navigate those, those spaces where, you know, those things show up, which is, you know, for being honest, it's all the time. Our emotions are, are constantly present in every interaction and engagement we have. So uh, your emotional intelligence is an, is an incredibly important uh, skill set to continue to learn and revise and get better at. The cover also has a question, will my partner ever recover? In your opinion, <clears throat> do you believe there's a definitive answer where people are healing or will they ever be healed? Um no, I don't think I can provide a definitive answer. I um, I think that it's it's you know it's everybody's journey individually, um, but I think that we can drastically reduce the the stress of the journey. I think we can reduce the time it takes to get to a place where you feel healed. Um, you know, I don't know that life ever affords us the opportunity to be one hundred percent healed in in all capacities at any point it's constantly throwing curveballs at us it's constantly throwing challenges, but we want to get to a place where we feel uh you know that we're at our best and I think that that is possible for survivors I think it's possible for uh partners I think it's you know absolutely imperative that, that we continue to work towards that in our relationships and you know through effective therapy and through, you know, being trauma informed as a partner, those are just, you know, some of the ways that we can really drastically reduce that so that we can push that answer towards yes, and a definitive, we can get fully healed uh, in, in what that, and what that means for the individual, you know, that's for them to decide. But um, I, I do believe it's possible for people to get to a place in their life where they recover, they, they recover that sense of, 
uh, you know, what was lost, the safety and security, the agency and autonomy, the, the trust they have for themselves and other people and the sense of intimacy and the desire for sexuality to be in their life and um, all of the different kinds of, you know, physical and emotional and mental wounds and spiritual scars that can be there and be present. I think uh, it's it's absolutely critical to, uh, you know, approach that with a, with a sense of determination that, um, you know, you can get out of that tunnel. And finally, are there any new projects that you're working on? Uh, yes, actually, I am. I'm, I'm writing a, a novel right now. Um, in the book, I talk about the need for processing the emotions that we have outside of the relationship. So as a partner, um, witnessing the, the recovery process, hearing the stories of the abuse and the trauma, it creates a lot of emotions. And I talk about the fact that we need as partners to find ways to kind of heal those uh, and deal with that and process those emotions outside of the relationship. So we're not reflecting that pain back into the relationship. Um, and the way I've found is to do it through art. So music and other kinds of creative writing. And one of the, the, the real struggles that I've had just personally is with a broken justice system, feeling like there just is this universal you know, karmic unfairness in the sense that somebody has done something to my loved one and, and no real justice has ever been done. And I know there's so many millions of people who feel the same way. And I, I felt the weight of that when I was researching this book. And so the creative writing pursuit is a, is a, is a novel uh, with also a graphic novel kind of uh, spinoff to it, where I kind of use my military background to create a, you know, squad of highly trained people that have the only goal is to eliminate, um, you know, the, this type of threat from the world. Um, and so it's kind of a action suspense thriller type of book that, that just kind of goes into more so talking about a lot of the issues worldwide through a more uh, fictional approach rather than the nonfiction approach. And Sean, you're welcome to let audiences know how they can support your work and contact you. Yeah, the uh, the links on seanhamilton.com, S-H-A-U-N-H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N.com. Uh, you, can, you can buy the book when your partner says hashtag me too uh, in print or through a digital copy, an ebook. And both of those links are on my website as well as, you know, kind of a, a sign up form if you just want to, you know, kind of be a part of the community um, as we as we kind of grow this thing and, you know, get more like minded people together to, you know, start creating more and more resources to help partners and survivors, uh, you know, kind of recover and share their journeys along the way. Thank you, Sean, for joining us on Sasha Talks. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.